There, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, presently in the Beatitudes. Um, we've done two, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who mourn, and uh, in this program we're going to look at blessed are the, the meek, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, Mark's going to ask God's blessing upon our time together. Oh, Lord, as we take this time just to concentrate on your word, we are just so thankful for it. Just open our eyes to it and to see how logical it is, how loving it is, and how we can apply it to our lives. Amen. 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 And if I didn't say it, I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, yes. Jesus Christ, on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself. Okay. As I say... We're going to look at the, the, the third of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. Okay. Before I get into it, I, I want to once again kind of consider the context of this statement. All right. The whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to, this is Jesus training his disciples in righteousness. Yes. That was true then when he did it. And it's true today. Mm -hmm. It still has the same purpose. All right? And if it's training us in righteousness, I want to just read this verse from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verse 6 says, In his days, talking about the Messiah, mm -hmm. Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. You see, if we're being trained in righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. The purpose of this teaching is simply to make us like Jesus. Like Jesus in what we believe, in what we think, in what we say, and what we do. Amen. That's what the purpose of this whole thing is, okay? See, so the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, and we, we talked about that, which is up on the site. It's about the lordship of Jesus Christ. Yes. But now, think about Jesus, mm -hmm. how submitted he was to the Father. And, and the great example of that is his prayer in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done. Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. And last program, we talked about blessed are those who mourn. And that was about a heart for the lost. Mm -hmm. Well, there is no greater example of a heart for the lost than Jesus who came into this world to die. That's, right. That's why he came. Because there is no atonement without the shedding of blood. For life is in the blood. That's what it says in Levit Leviticus 17. So he came because of his heart for the for the, And by the lost, I mean me. And Mark. And me. And Alice. Mm -hmm. And you. Okay? So now, if we're going to talk about spiritual meekness, we have to recognize the fact that Jesus is our example of meekness. Okay? He's our example for everything. For everything that we, that's what I said. Yes. The purpose of this is that we would become, it says, you know, Paul said in Ephesians 5.1, there would be imitators right. of God. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is God's whole purpose, is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is our destiny. This is the destiny of those who have accepted Jesus as both Lord and Savior. Because Paul wrote in Romans, Romans chapter 8, for, for whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And John said, you know, when we see Jesus as he is, we will be Amen. as he is. That's the purpose. And this is what we're being trained for now through God's word. To behave like him, to think like him, to talk like him, right? I said, you know, that's what the Beatitudes are. It's about the behavior and the attitudes of the righteous. I want to start looking at blessed are the meek by saying that spiritual meekness is an oxymoron mm -hmm. and a paradox mm -hmm. because Jesus, the humble king,
king of glory has the power of life and death. There is no greater power that exists in anybody than in Jesus. All right? I'm going to refer to a verse. I want to, I'm going to read a verse from Philippians now, and we'll probably refer to it a lot during this study. And this is from Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 is what I'm going to read. Have this attitude or this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is no greater example of meekness. There is no greater example of humility than Jesus Christ. He humbled himself. And is that not the instruction to us? You know, James, the Apostle James wrote, and he said, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So, I said it's an oxymoron and it's a paradox. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. And one of the tools that I use all the time in these Bible studies is a dictionary. dictionary. Da, da, da. An oxymoron, that's two seemingly contradictory words that are used together for effect. Like jumbo shrimp. Exact estimate. <laughs> Tragic comedy. Deafening silence. The larger hair, something that's pretty ugly. <laughs> okay. Or military intelligence. Yeah, well, I'm not going there, but that's. Uh... Now, the word oxymoron actually comes from a Greek word that means, oxys means sharp, mm -hmm. and moros meant stupid. Right. So it's a combination, it's like putting the two together. You know, it's, it's, it's at the same time being sharp and being stupid. That's an oxymoron, it's contradictory. A paradox, on the other hand, I want to read from the dictionary, right? Mm -hmm. It's a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality exp expresses a possible truth. An opinion or statement contrary to commonly accepted opinion. A seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that may or may not be true. An opinion that conflicts with common belief. Well, that's what a paradox is, and that comes from the Latin word paradoxum and the Greek word paradoxos, and that means contrary to opinion, okay? So what I want to say is that a paradox is not opposed to truth, it is, but rather it's opposed to what people generally take to be true. Mm -hmm. And there is no greater example of that than the Sermon on the Mount, yes. in its entirety, okay? So we gather in, in God's Word. We gather to gain wisdom and understanding, mm -hmm. right? And, and the Father and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into us yes. to lead us into all truth. So we have the power to understand. And it says in Proverbs 3.13, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. How blessed is a man who finds wisdom. It sounds like another beatitude, right? It does, yeah. Now you see the world's wisdom, which James calls earthly, natural, and demonic, as opposed to wisdom from above. I, I always called purple grass, and that's kind of a long story, but it's purple grass was the idea, and I'll do this as briefly as I can. I, I, I said, and this struck me many, 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 many years ago. Yes. It's like, if you had an evil, evil father who just was mean, just evil, and as a child he would take you out and take you out into a field and, and teach you and say to you, see that grass? That's purple. And day after day, month after month, year after year, he would tell, tell you yeah. that, that that grass that you're looking at is purple. Well, then all of a sudden you find out that that father is evil. All right? Lied. Because you know what? Prior to your being saved, you were walking around and you know you were you were the walking dead and you were listening to the world, you were listening to Jesus, to, to, to Satan Same. rather, right? Yes. And he was telling you lies because he's a liar by nature and he's the father of lies. Mm -hmm. 
So now along comes Jesus, who's, who is the truth, and he says, no. See that grass? It's green. Yes. Hallelujah. And you recognize that's truth because you know Jesus, and you know that he's the truth. Right. So you go out tomorrow, and you look at that grass. Hallelujah. And you know what you see? Purple. This is why you have to be renewed by, or, or you know, conform, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because you've been conditioned in the natural to these lies. That's right. All right? And you have to take those thoughts captive. Captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Okay? The world is in the power of the evil one. That's what it says in 1 John 5, 19. He's a liar by nature and a father of lies, just like I said, right? So you, you've got to understand that what you brought into your new life was, was lies. Mm -hmm. And this is like Jesus going to Bethany, calling Lazarus out of the tomb. Hallelujah. And he comes into new life, but he came into new life, out of that tomb and into new life. But he was still wrapped in the garments yes. of death. Yes. And we come into this new life still wrapped in all of our old habits and traditions. All our old ways of thinking, still connected to that old worldly culture mm -hmm. that we grew up in. And this is why we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, all right? And that's what Jesus is doing with the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. He's over and over. He said, and we'll get to this. You know, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Mm -hmm. He is changing our way of thinking. Hallelujah. Jesus is the ultimate paradox. I mean, here he is. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of glory. And yet he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He is humility. Yes. He is the King who came as a servant. He is the Lord who washed the feet of his disciples. Mm -hmm. He is the one in whom all the fullness of deity dwells, yet he emptied himself. Yes. He is the master whose name is life, yet he humbled himself in obedience to death, even death on a cross. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. You know, Jesus said, um, again, this is John 12. Jesus said, he answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Right? That's backwards from what yes. we think. Yeah. And that's what we have. We have to come to the Word of God, recognizing it's going to contradict what we have heard said. Mm -hmm. And now it becomes our new thinking, right? Yes. You know, there was really, there was a beautiful song. So I, I, I'm sure a lot of you know it. Uh, Graham Kendrick in the UK wrote this. It was back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. and, and it captures this paradox so well. Meekness and majesty. Oh, yes. Meekness and majesty. Manhood and deity. In perfect harmony, the man who is God. Wisdom unsearchable, God the invisible. Love indestructible, in frailty appears. Lord of affinity, infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of his throne. Mm. I, that's, that's absolutely wonderful, right? Yes. So now, you have to have all this in mind when we begin to look at God saying, blessed are the meek, right? blessed are the gentle. Right? Because in, in our society, that's not what you know, that's not what's considered the, the yeah. goal that you want to aim for. Right? That's not what gets you to the top. No, no. You know, I said this to Alice, and I, I'll, I'll date this, and I don't particularly want to, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the beginning, or probably in the midst, of a presidential campaign season here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And in, in the Republican Party, there is a candidate, Donald J. Trump, mm -hmm. who is just, I mean blowing away all of the other candidates. I mean, he is so far ahead of them. And the reason is, and people keep saying this, it's because of his strength. He shows strong. You know, he's, he, he talks about strength and being strong. Well, that's what the world thinks the answer is. 
But Jesus is saying, blessed are the meek. And you want to know something? That's the world. That's, that's between them and God. I'm not, I'm not here to judge the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world. No. He came in to save, right? Yes. But we in the body of Christ are supposed to get this. Meek, again in the dictionary, it means humbly patient or docile, as under provocation from others. Well, how much more docile, more docile. and meek can you get than Jesus Christ? You know, going to trial be, before the mm -hmm. before the council, before the uh, Pontius Pilate, the power of Rome, being mocked and whipped and beaten, nailed to a cross, and yet his response is, "Father, forgive them." That's right. And had it not, had he not done that, had he called ten thousand angels and wiped everything out, we'd be in big trouble. We'd be in bigger trouble than we can begin to understand. And then the dictionary says that being meek is overly submissive or compliant. No. Can't be overly submissive. Patient, long-suffering, submissive in disposition or nature, humble, spineless or spiritless, compliant. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just, well, that's because yeah. the world... That's a worldly adaptation it, it, or a world yeah. view of that. It, it is. Yeah. You see, parts of that are true yeah. and parts of it are not true. Well, you have to have a truth. Well, it's like... Yes, a bit of poison. You know, if, I want to, if, if Satan wants to kill us, he's more subtle than any other beast of the field. If he's going to poison us, he doesn't have to give us a whole thing. It just, you know, add a little poison to the truth, right? You can't be overly submissive when you are to be totally submissive to the will of God. Okay? Totally complying with all he has commanded. And that is hardly spiritless. Because it's being filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? And it does not mean weak. Not at all. Meek does not mean weak. No. It takes incredible strength to be meek. Well, that's what I wanted to say, right? It takes real strength to be, to be meek. However, having said that, it's not quite true because it's a paradox. Mm -hmm. What it takes to be meek is the willingness to die to yourself. It is obedience to God to be willing to die to yourself. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despise God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Oh, wow. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. Now you see, the purpose is humility. That's right. You have nothing to boast in. God didn't choose you because, oh my goodness, he looked down and said, boy, he's got, I need him. No, he chose you because you're foolish. Ha, ha, ha. He chose you because you're weak. Because then he can be glorified in and through you. That's right. It's about the glory of God. And we have to get to that place because pride is the fall of man. And pride says you want to be strong. You want to show forth that you, you are able. You you're not able. Your own. Yeah. That's the whole point. Being meek is being, being willing to say, being humble is being willing to say, I'm not able. That's, right. That's why we're talking about poor spirit. You have to be totally dependent on God. Totally. The, the followers of Jesus Christ are to be, uh, you got to excuse the mixed metaphor here, mm. little lambs mm. who are gentle and innocent as doves. That's what it says in Matthew 10, 16. Yeah. And as courageous as lions. That's what it says in Proverbs 28.1. That's that oxymoron. That's that paradox. All right? This is like, like the Apostle Paul. Remember Paul with the thorn in the flesh? Mm -hmm. He said, concerning this, the thorn in the flesh, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
That is exactly the opposite of the world. That's right. It's exactly the opposite of the world. But God promises to bless you when you do this. Because when you depend on him, he will answer you. When you depend on yourself, he'll sit back and say, well, let's see how this works out for you. It's true. He'll let you try and take care of it. He'll let you. He'll give you he'll take a shot. We've been conditioned and trained by the world to aggressively pursue the things that we want and to stand up, stand up and be men. Taught that real men are strong and tough. And all too often it's the church that teaches the same thing. You know what? Peter. Peter was a tough guy. Now how do I know that? He was a fisherman. Just, just like his brother and the others who fished with him. How do I know? Because sailors, fishermen, and commercial, commercial fishermen, they're tough. They're strong. That's tough. That's hard work. That's tough. They've got to be really strong. Peter heard this Sermon on the Mount firsthand. Yes. He heard Jesus teach that he, not just we, should love our enemies. Mm. He heard Jesus say that he was not to resist an evil person. That if somebody struck him, he was to turn the other cheek. He heard all of this in the yes, firsthand in the Sermon on the Mount. But in the garden, mm. when the Roman soldiers, the officers of the chief priests, and the Pharisees came to take Jesus... Peter quickly struck out with his sword and injured the servant of the high priest. He cut off his ear. Peter was ready to defend Christ. You know, it says in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Who shall I dread? If you lift up arms to defend Christianity, there is no Christianity left to defend. You know, though none of the dictionaries say this, the word teaches it. The opposite of being meek is not strength. Mm -mm. The opposite of being gentle is not strength. The opposite of being meek is pride. A study not long ago at UCLA out in California showed that men actually overcome their fears and show off primarily for the benefit of females, but also for other men, for pride. Mm -hmm. It's about self-esteem, a highly cultivated goal, both inside and outside the church. Self-esteem. You want to know something? You will be so weak in spiritual things until you recognize the only thing that matters is that God esteems you. And we'll see that more as we get into the Sermon on the Mount. When you know and real, I mean, really know how much He loves you, you won't you won't have any issues with self esteem. Now, I'm a guy. Mm -hmm. The question is, am I brave enough to talk about women? <laughs> In America, tens of billions of dollars are spent each year for jewelry, for makeup, the $8 billion spent on each year um, just for cosmetics. And that $8 billion, that's what it would be. Amazing. Is coincidentally roughly the same amount that it would take to provide clean water and sanitation to all the people living in developing countries. It's about pride. And priorities. Well... You know, when you have pride, that sort of establishes your priorities. Your priorities become you. That's in the right. last days, men will become lovers of self. self. We live in the age of selfies. Yes. We, yes. We, I, I can't imagine a time when there was more focus on self than there is today. It's about pride. It's about thinking that this is how you must show yourself to the world. Mm. You know, there's a, it's like there's a weekly fashion show that takes place at churches every week. Mm -hmm. You know, I've passed the churches in different places. And I, I know, you know, I've had people coming in there. They were, they were afraid they didn't want to come to church because they couldn't dress That's right. Properly, yeah. Which they thought would be properly. Well, how did, how did we... Robes of righteousness. That's how did we get to the place where we allowed that to happen? Yes. And you know what? That's a rhetorical question because the fact is, 
There's, you don't, it doesn't need an answer. We all know the answer to that. This is seeking the approval of, of either self or others is, however, quite contrary to the instruction to show yourself approved to God, as Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15. God has always chosen and then elevated the humble. Yes. And he will put down the proud. James said, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. James 4.10. Peter said, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. 1 Peter 5.6. Like Moses did. You see, now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Numbers 12.3. Like John the Baptist did. John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong, thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 3, 16. John also said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John 3, 30. Like Paul did. Paul said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. Wretched man that I am. Romans 7, 18, 19, and verse 24. But then that humility brings you to a place where God exalts you and you know there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he lifts you up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and sets your feet upon a rock, a rock that is higher than you. And his name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Paul called himself the foremost of sinners. And God said, there's a man I can use. All right. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3, 4. You know what? This is all in there. How come we don't know this? How come we're not hearing more about humility? Yes. I mean, when you go to, go to the, the church building on a Sunday, how often do you hear about humility? How often do you hear about dying to self? How often do you hear about you decreasing as Christ increases in you? We're hearing, you know, you're going there for instruction on how you can be more important looking, how you can be richer, wealthier, healthier. Is that what God wants? No. Or is that what your flesh wants? Yes, that's the flesh. Is that what Jesus did? Or did Jesus humble himself? Yes. Even, you know, when it gets into it, it's like, you know, we're going to do, God is going to train his disciples. This is all training to send them out into the world, to be those ambassadors for Christ. Mm -hmm. And he says, when you do your good works, do them in a way that men see them and glorify God your Father. Amen. Not that they glorify you. Any glory that you take robs it from God. And that's not a good thing. No. Humility is the way up, mm. not the way down. And the Lord wants to bless you and lift you up higher and higher. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instruction that you're giving us in this Sermon on the Mount. We thank you, Lord God, for the example of your son, Jesus Christ, that we will know how to live, what to believe, Lord God, what to believe, what to speak, and how to act. And by the power of your Holy Spirit within us, not by our own strength, but by the power of your Spirit, we are able to do what you're calling us to. And I pray, Lord God, that men would see our work, see us, and then see your son Christ Jesus in us and be drawn to him, Father, in his name. Amen. Till next time, God bless you. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners